Hi friends, my name is Host Eric, I'm the host of Talking With Fans People, and this video, as you can see, I've laid out exactly what this video is, so I'm just going to go down that rather than try to freestyle it. As far as framing this NarcDoc vid, which is doctors or other personalities, YouTubers, who say they know about nar narcissism and comment upon it. You might include myself in that equation. I do sometimes do so. I'm not a doctor of any sort, but I find that totally irrelevant, of course. So the engine of this basic video, or my thesis, you might say, is to exemplify frame bias. My purpose for the video is to exemplify frame bias in each of these individuals as they're talking about narcissism, and, in my, and also in terms of my own reactions to them. Uh, intellectual work I'm going to be doing here is to analyze these examples to clarify what frame bias is and to clarify some information about cognitive functions at the same time. The critical work will be to discuss how the shortcomings of frame stuntage produce harms, as exemplified by each of these individuals. Highlighted, the personal link, some descriptions of narcissists match descriptions of me, or at least some people use descriptions of narcissists made by other parties to project the label of narcissist onto me. So I negate that linkage in this video and argue frame bias is instead responsible here for the their reductive descriptions of narcissists or negation of things that aren't, not, 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 aren't necessarily toxic as narcissistic in some regard, either implicitly or explicitly. Um, that this part of the video will be a zero-sum critique and has clear subjective links, so we'll listen to the most pushback should there be any. And then lastly, there's an entertainment frame. I'm going to pause at types for both Carter and Romani, and we're going to get to look at a lot of little clips here. Hopefully Romani doesn't give me too much trouble about it. She's got all this, like, don't use my shit stuff up there, but I think I can get her reasoning why, and I don't think this is going to run afoul of her uh, of her justifications accordingly. So let's take a look then at the first clip. Anyone out there who's actually immune to narcissists, meaning that they're just not bothered by them. Okay, so she's describing immune to narcissists, meaning they're just not bothered by them. And she goes on to clarify some other things about this, which, um, which clarify that she's not, she's not saying that it's necessarily a good thing not to be bothered by narcissists, but rather that some people don't seem to be bothered by them. And in fact, that can um, sometimes manifest as um, as as a bad thing. Okay. So, for example, we hear that here in this part. They minimize the struggles you are having with the narcissist, and they may also not call the narcissist out. So the narcissist will stay up to their usual tricks. It just doesn't bother the person who's immune to it. Okay, so obviously I like this a lot about Dr. Romani because it acknowledges some linkage to extroverted intuition and introverted thinking as a potential solution not just as a problem, right? Of course, when we're talking about these YT years that we're talking about here tonight, using these examples, the predominant frame of reference for them is who's my audience and who am I talking to? Romani is clearly talking mostly to people who feel as though they've been abused or are victimized by a narcissist in some way. From my perspective, of course, I'm analyzing these videos as somebody who's been in a relationship with somebody who's BPD but didn't feel damaged by it at all, and who's mostly angry about narcissists impacting people around me, especially Rachel or or Corey, for example, um, and to the extent that we want to differentiate between BPD and narcissist, I think is why it's BPD, but regardless, uh, the point is, obviously I have a different different audience in mind here. I'm not trying to talk to people who have been victimized by narcissists and how bad it is and stuff. I'm instead trying to analyze these frames of reference from a cognitive function perspective. All right, so let's go on to... Uh, so she, she she's indicated here that a couple of things, right? She's indicated that people who are immune don't feel anything, but acknowledge that this may mean they don't go call them, call them out, right? Um, so, another thing she says about people who have a good relationship with narcissists is as follows. 
The fourth thing we see in people who are sort of immune to the narcissist is that they're able to set and maintain boundaries. Probably because they are relatively immune to the narcissist's bad behavior, they know when to quit. Okay, so the thing is, knowing when to quit doesn't mean knowing when to stop caring. So, and that's the distinction I wanted to make here regarding this. It is, it is the case, for example, that when a narcissist behaves badly around me, I'm not going to, um, I'm not going to allow their bad behavior to prompt me into bad indefensible behavior because I know that's just going to give them ammunition, right? So that's knowing when to stop. But what we see here so far is TI is an absolute value. FE is operationally a value, as we'll see in a second. And that, and there's a question about the SINI matter. She seems to uh, have a some awareness of SI in other people, but not necessarily experiencing it from her own perspective so much. So I, you, know, you, know, you may be understanding where I'm leaning for her typologically. Let's look at the next one. So um, here's her explication of what happens when a narcissist gets upset or whatever, gets called out. Basically, though, narcissists show their narcissistic rage when someone hurts their fragile feelings. And the takeaway I have for this is you can just sort of tell her general contempt for feelings, right? Which is suggestive of this TI absolute value. She's only operationally FE. Um, and you can hear it again here. Someone so charming, maybe even so arrogant, so sure of themselves, can be so sensitive when things don't go their way or someone doesn't say exactly what it is they want. At first, Okay, so uh, this one I particularly clip because it's something somebody might well say about me. Of course, you have to be ignoring a lot of contextual stuff. Like, like a person's been persistently unfair in expecting me to hear their words but not hearing my words for a long time before I start taking this kind of approach. But you'll notice that for somebody who's very dry, like this individual... She's projecting a frame bias that any kind of emotionality is a bad response to it, really, and that success is emotional detachment, which I don't necessarily agree with, okay? So if we look at then how she, how this plays out, it plays out as um, indifference equals success. And that means you've achieved the top of the mountain in terms of coping with a narcissist, which is utter indifference. And it additionally comes out as um, the no more headspace thing, which I've discussed before. But also, let's look at her understanding of how justice occurs reasons. Number one, they burn so many bridges. If you screw over enough people, it's a numbers game. It's bound to catch up to you. Okay, so it's basically she's externalizing the locus of responsibility to hold people accountable while kind of giving me yeah, kind of lip service to whether or not pulling people accountable is good. Uh, and the reason is, of course, because she's not naturally going to win arguments as easily as some other type might, might win them. And so it's going to see the attempt to argue as a fundamentally futile effort that plays into the narcissist's hands. Likely to be met with contempt or mockery of them suggesting, oh, oh, I got it. you think you're perfect. Then the whole conversation devolves into them painting you as a self-righteous believer in your own perfection, and it all gets really confusing really fast. It's a very, very tough argument to win. That is what happens. It's not a tough argument to win. Because the thing is, what people have a lot of trouble dealing with is staying on their own course. When I dealt with Rachel's mom on the phone, my question was, were you lying when you said that? Every answer that wasn't yes, no to that was not answering my question. And I didn't let it get me off course. The reason these kind of arguments devolve into garbage and works in the nurse's hands is not because it's inherently a bad idea to argue. Is because most people can't stay on point. They can't understand what their purpose is and execute that plan consistently, which is totally understandable. I'm not saying everybody should argue. I'm saying it's a mistake to project 
her own inability to handle that onto every other party, you know. Not, I, I like Romani a lot. I don't have any problems with her. I'm not trying to shit on her or anything. I'm just saying, um, I'm pointing out cognitive function stuff, right? Okay, so now let's look at, uh, lastly, how there's kind of an implicit contradiction here that's, that's drawn out in this clip. Recovery also takes a long time, and in some ways it's an ongoing and lifelong process. You can't just be careful or have good boundaries for a year. To recover means making lifelong shifts. Okay, so that would recommend, yeah, that, that would rec that would, uh, represent an SESI kind of acknowledgement that there needs to be a lot of follow through and stuff in order to deal with this and the recovery can take a long time, etc. But I also see it as validating of, of the dramatic life change approach that Rachel took in extricating herself from this situation, which is, is nice from a personal level, right? And remember, that's a personal frame of reference is part of the frame of reference for anything that anybody makes. Whether Dr. Romani or me, she's got her personal frame of reference as well. And it's it's revealed but not made explicit by her as I'm making mine explicit here because she's neither a debater nor has the benefit of understanding cognitive functions. So, um, what you see here is a lot of linkage to her interface knowledge bias and the risks thereof. Uh, that, And then when she talks about the people who, who actually who actually seem to transcend this problem to some extent. What is she talking about? Well, let's see. Oops, sorry. Okay, now we're gonna go to a different lady. So, what Carter's, I mean, what um, Ramani's approach is basically is one of information and some prescription but mostly description descriptive information informing how narcissists pull their tricks so that you can recognize them better it's a knowledge interface kind of approach in the sense that she's informing you and what you should know and and acknowledging that you can't decide out ahead and then follow through on a course of argumentational action like i just described because she's a knowledge interface type, almost certainly an INFJ. Okay, now let's go on to another frame of reference to demonstrate the contrast with this lady, okay? So, this lady is another person who's talked about narcissists. You can rely on me and or I've got your back. And she says that one, one thing that narcissists say is you can rely on me. She also says, You can be vulnerable with me. You can be vulnerable with me is another thing that narcissists say. And fortunately for us, there is this person, Jachima, who wrote down all of her things and what they basically mean in narcissist tongue. You can be vulnerable with me means give me information to use against you later. I've got your back means being on your side is convenient for me at this time. It's not my fault. The world made me do it. It will get better. I am buying time. I am honest. Believe my lies. I'm going to change. Don't leave me buying more time. I love you. I love how you make me feel. Okay, so I think that's all fine and dandy. The thing I'm point out here is the the intended audience for this lady who made those seven rules is clearly for people who are being tricked currently by narcissists and to recognize that the literal meanings of their words are deceptive, right? So it's, that, that's limited in its scope of claim by the audience that it's trying to address. Okay, so now let's look at the more problematic, from my perspective, the most problematic, from my perspective, individual who's making stuff here on this thing, which is Carter, okay? So Carter approaches this whole thing from a very emotional frame that invalidates a lot of stuff that's that ought not be invalidated okay so let's let's look first to this one and basically they want control or we could put it in different terms they want dominance 
They want superiority. They want everything to go according to their game plan, according to their preferences, their cravings, their desires. They're very self-absorbed kind of individuals, and it's all about oneself, and they want to make sure that you understand that and so that you can perpetuate and keep that game of theirs going. That's what they want. Okay. So what we see there is a sloppiness with language, right? There's a difference between control and dominance. Uh, there's a difference between seizing a leadership position in various ways and maybe being stern about it even and being controlling as a desired outcome. I don't like being controlling. I am sometimes dominant and sometimes I'm not. Sometimes I'm the learner and the follower. And his failure to address the distinction between those qualities, those, those qualitatively different kinds of things is what makes him, in my opinion, uh, not a safe voice in this arena and, and one we should we should really give us a lot of second thoughts to so let's let's see here again how he displays his frame projection and frame bias in ways that show a lack of self-awareness I don't think I'm going to play into that role uh, or that expectation that you have from me. I'm going to be my own person, and in doing so, uh, if you want to engage with me, then you'll have to come to terms with that. Now, that kind of thinking drives narcissists crazy. You don't cower when they attempt to shame you or invalidate you or put guilt trips upon you. Let's keep in mind, going a long way back into a narcissist's deep history, uh, the name of the game for them is shame. Now, of course, what we know is that a lot of times people do deserve to be shamed for their bad behavior, that the public... The, the light of day on the subjective bullshit of somebody else is often just fine and a good thing. But from this guy's perspective, he's so FI, almost certainly ENFP, that he doesn't understand that accountability gets sacrificed when he's this sloppy with his language, right? Okay, let's look at a third Carter one. And this is probably the most offensive one at all because talk about uh, being overgeneralized by his audience for sure, who are likely FI tool users themselves. Now, granted, this is my TI tool using bias, but note that I'm incorporating and understanding that there are elements of what he's saying that are absolutely correct. That the problem isn't that he's never right, it's that he's sloppy, right? And I don't think anybody can critique that, that critique. That's not, I'm not condemning FI itself. I am perhaps acknowledging that FI comes along with the sort of sloppiness that I pointed out with Romani before. She's attributing it to a narcissist, but really that's from a narcissist who's FI. They're sloppy like that. TI narcissists aren't going to be like that. All right, so let's look at this last one now. You refuse to argue. Narcissists and you don't need me to tell you this, they're highly argumentative. Uh, they have a simmering anger that's constantly right there beneath the surface. Annoyance, irritability, agitation uh, is just uh, one false statement or one false decision away uh, from them. Okay, so obviously this is the most, like, irritating one. Because usually people who refuse to argue are people who are themselves accountability avoidant, right? And we don't want to encourage that accountability avoidance. It is okay to insist about public discourse matters that parties are held accountable for the words they say. In fact, it's a good positive thing. So when I'm making this video, Dr. Carter may feel attacked. He may feel like I'm being argumentative, that he doesn't want to argue and that's fine. And I'm not saying he should be forced to. I'm saying if he were responsible in his public discourse, he'd acknowledge that those kind of subjective claims to not having to defend or justify your, what you're saying are only acceptable in interpersonal relationships and make that explicitly clear in his videos. He should because in the status quo, he's doing harm. Okay, lastly, I'd like you to show you, to show you a great example of TI, then FE, then SE as an absolute value. And here you go. Look at me smoking indoors. I didn't ask anybody. What are they gonna do? Kick me out before I get the prize? This is called leverage. Okay, so what you saw there was TI, a deliberation function, an objective deliberation function that says there's not any good reason for me not to smoke in here. There's not any good justification. So I'm going to. 
I'm not going to ask anybody else because I don't care whether they really affirm or disagree with me because ultimately I'm the wisest person to make the decision. That's why Jung thought it was subjective because it's that self important, I guess. Except if it's strong, if it's high up on the mix, right? You're, you are among those very select few who can say consistently my judgment's better than than the consensus. Um, then you saw him just say, use the FE knowledge he had, which is, well, it's not like they can do anything because I'm the, the subject of this show. I'm getting the award, so what are they going to do? Kick me out of here? And then explains it as, ultimately, leverage from an SE perspective. Uh, but doesn't actually... The way he talks about it isn't as though the not asking anybody and just doing it was SE, right? He was anticipating all the arguments ahead of time. Because he's almost certainly an INTP, possibly an ENTP. So, the thing is, what, what both of these psychologist guys, or whatever you want to call them, Dr. Armani is an official clinical therapist, who cares about your credentials? Not me, not at all, okay? And that, that, the fact that you put that up there so big does make me lose a little respect for you. Because obviously, I'm way more correct about things, regardless, right? I'm not saying you're wrong about narcissism. I'm just saying I understand the larger frames of reference and how you, too, are a human being projecting your own frame biases, as am I. And that credentials don't change that. You can't, you can't credential away your frame bias, right? But, um, but Carter, doesn't he seem like just this bundle of fucking hurt feelings? It's so annoying. Anyway, both these people need to learn to distinguish between things that are particularist in, in appropriate attention and things that are universalist in appropriate attention. And they need to distinguish between public claims, public discourse, and the, the reasonable expectation of the other regarding defensibility of those public claims and claims about somebody's identity. So I'm not really, with the exception of me saying, doesn't he seem like a bundle of hurt feelings? Uh, I'm not really attacking the identity of either Romani or Carter or that lady. I'm just describing kind of how their identities project with this frame blindness that comes with not using cognitive functions as the meta frame. But um, obviously I'm projecting my own frame bias too and saying, ew, to Dr. Carter because he's got so much FI, which I don't like it to see in public discourse. It seems to me ill-placed and ill-suited for all parties to be impacted by. So anyway, I hope you enjoyed this video. I don't know why I made it really because I started watching a Dr. Romani video earlier and I was like, yeah, I like you, but you've got a couple things wrong. <laughs> You know me. I'm just like that.